So some would be bold, great, great. Just they basically just ended on Russia on the Balkans for one part of the world. Yes, that's so definitely, that was a cause of World War I, right? And it is kind of important. I, it, I, I, I was being a little bit dangerous by talking about World War II first and then going back to talk about World War I because you may run the risk of confusing the two. But if you were to, in a super easy way, distinguish between World War I and World War II, how would you do it? What would be the best way to distinguish the two? Yeah. Well, Japan was in the first World War II. Hitler clearly is in World War II. No, they were big. This is their opportunity to expand and take over. The thing is, they were on the Allied side. In World War II, they're on the Axis side. But what's, if you were to, like, in a summary, a general summary, how would you describe the difference between, like, in a sentence, World War I and World War II? Was so it World War I about alliances and World War II was um, ideology? Okay, about empires, and that's what you mean by alliances. You write balance of power, that's exactly right. Empires, it's, it's really about power, balances of power. And that's, that's the exact opposite of ideology in a sense, because you're wanting to make sure that you've got more strength so that other people fear you, which is not ideology, right? You're not doing it because it's right, you're doing it because you're worried about getting killed. And, and the second one is absolutely all about ideology. You still have the old holdovers from the empire days, and that's the Axis powers. They want rule by might. And then it's kind of weird. It's the new folks, the, the, the allies that want rule by law. And you can't just take somebody over. The whole world is going to respond by you taking over Poland. And it's not just that you're going to get more powerful, but you, there has to be a sense of international law. And you could make the same argument, and I certainly make this argument, and I'll tell you, you go up to Madison or other history departments, they will not make this argument. They tend to be more pragmatic. Pragmatism is always going to have, an, um, I'm sorry, dialectical interpretation is a much more pragmatic approach. They don't believe in the ideology. So they'll say that the Cold War was also just about balance of power. And that they'll say everything is always about balance of power. There's no distinction between World War I and World War II. For me, it doesn't make much sense for why it is England is so strongly on the side of uh, the UN. And, and why would England willingly give up their colonies? Why would the Americans want them to give up their colonies? Because we're not gaining any colonies. We want everybody to give up the colonies. That's, if you're looking for power, that's the exact opposite thing that you would do. But if you're doing it in terms of establishing kind of a new world order, and that's exactly what you would do. Now, for me, but I'm kind of an ideological guy. I, I look in that way. I'm very optimistic. I, I see the idealism in it. But if you are a professor who doesn't, if you see the world simply as a conflict between rich and poor, black and white, men and women, and then everything is just a conflict, and everything is about power. And so for them, they, they're going to interpret it completely different. And your textbooks, more often than not, are going to be on the side of the dialectical which is just not a problem, except that you're not going to get that alternative view. And so what I'm giving you is this alternative view. Your job is to weigh it and decide which one you like. So, uh, yes, we were talking about that, but there was also something else that we were talking about. Does anybody else remember? The Korean, we were talking about the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And yes. And what they represented. Okay. And what did they represent? Because that's exactly what... They represented kind of trying to let the country, the country decide for themselves. Okay. They were because um, other countries were trying to not invade, but put their beliefs on them. Okay, excellent, very good, you're on the ball. Now, when we say other countries, what do we mean? And this is where I need to be a bit more detailed so you have some specific facts. Because I think the big story, we've been building on the big story basically since the French Revolution. But there's some details you need to get in order for that big story to make sense. We have uh, the World War II, 1941 to 1945 for the United States, for Europe, and this is Western civilization, that's going to be 1939 to 1945. And for Asia, when does it start in Asia? Oh, on the ball, 1931 to 1945. And what is it that really sparks it in Asia? What's the event? Japan invades China. Japan invades Manchuria. And Manchuria, oddly enough, is actually um, 
a northern province of China. It's actually it's like an under, another country, but it's under Chinese rule. And so this means that between China and Japan, there's a conflict. Now, if we were doing um, world history, which we'll do next year, this is this fits into a, a really big story of China. China has periods where it gets really strong and centralized, and then it has periods when it's really decentralized. And it kind of goes back and forth like a pendulum. In, in the year 220 BC, a guy named Shi Huangdi, he's the one that starts the Chinese, uh, the Wall of China. And they say about 200,000 people worked on this, and probably at least thousands of them died in the process. But he was able to build the Great Wall of China in like 11 years, because he just had everybody working on it. Very strong central power. And as soon as he dies, then China is steady for about 200 years, and then it begins to fragment. And then it has a period of about 600 years during the, oh, it's called the Sixth Dynasty period. The Sixth Dynasty period, which, which is fragmented. And what it means is that there's actually fragmented into six big provinces. And then it comes back together in the Song China uh, Dynasty, the Sui Dynasty, and the Song Dynasty is maintained, and then it fragments again. It goes back and forth and back and forth. The reason why this is important to us is that the last time that it was really, really consolidated was around the 1600s. And when it did this, it was very strong. This is when they, divided, uh, they created this um, um, isolationism policy where everybody in China goes through one port called Canton. And so this was their attempt to preserve their cultural identity. We talked about this a little bit where Japan had complete isolations. Same general century. In around 1600, Japan has complete isolation. They can do it because they're an island. China can't. It can't be completely isolated. But as best they can, you know, you got big mountains here. Nepal, Mount Everest is right here. you got big giant desert here. You've got some Southeast Asia. What they did is they said, well, this is where we're going to talk with the rest of the world, just through Canton. And it was mildly successful. The problem is that by the time we get to 1900, it had fragmented. In fact, so much had it fragmented that by 1908, that's when they had their very last emperor. In fact, there was a movie about 20 years ago called The Last Emperor. It's very sad. It's about this little boy, basically, who was the last emperor. And that's when Chinese, the Chinese dynasty just collapses all around. And between 1908 to about 1945, there is no strong government. It's fragmented. And so you have what you might call warlords, which are basically people that control different regions. Tacitly, there might be somebody who's a central government, but China's so big, you don't have any strength. Now, why does it matter at all that China is in this defragmented? How does it fit in with the 1931 thing? How does it fit in with what we're going to talk about with the Cold War? Does anybody have a guess? They're behind technology. Okay. technologically. They are behind technologically. They've got no industrialization. They don't get industrialization until the 1970s. 70s. Okay? Our lifetime, well, my lifetime, not your lifetime. 1970s. And so they are behind technologically. What else? Else go? And again, this isn't world history, so you may not know this, but if you've looked at Japanese language and Korean and Chinese and Vietnamese, does it look similar? If you know nothing about the languages, would you immediately be able to distinguish between which country and another? No. no, it's just like if you were Chinese and you were to look at, say, English and Spanish and German, would you be able to really tell the difference? No. And I'll use the same script. Well, the reason of that similarity is that the Chinese were the center, it was they were the hot spot of cultural diffusion, just like Europe became the center in Western civilization. For Eastern civilization, it was China. So right here is Korea. China influenced Korea. This is Southeast Asia. China influenced Southeast Asia. In fact, around the year 200, uh, between 200 um, AD to about 1100 AD, China had a huge influence on Japan. And you don't realize this, but Japan actually has an alphabet with their characters but their characters are all Chinese script. So they took Chinese script, which is like symbols, and then they turned it into an alphabet and they made it into Japanese. And so if you were Chinese, 
you wouldn't be able to read the Japanese, even though it's got very familiar characters. You'd say, oh, that says something like this, but it's nothing like what it is in fact. And same thing with Japanese. They could look and recognize certain characters in Chinese, but they wouldn't have any connection. And so what we have is a strong influence, evidence of cultural effusion in this area. And because China kind of goes in this pendulum where it's really strong and tight, and then it's fragmented, there are times when China was very, very powerful and it had a huge influence. And then there are times when it was less powerful. And so what happens to the influence? Now, in this time, right up to around 1900, it got less powerful before 1900s, even say the late 1800s. So much so that people like France had taken over parts of Southeast Asia as a colony. It was a French colony. The Dutch took over some of these islands. Okay. Japan remained completely isolated. So they hadn't been under Chinese control for probably, I don't know, a thousand years. Or Chinese, heavy Chinese influence, we should say. Korea had been out of Chinese control for probably 100, maybe 200 years before 1900. So why is this important? Well, if you remember, the other story has to do with Japan. And Japan chose to be isolated in 1600 until 1850. you remember this story? What happens in 1850s? I think it's 1856. They, don't they see the fleet of... of Exactly. American Commodore Perry, an American commoner, so he's the heart of the fleet. We go into Japan. We're not trying to start to steal a colony or anything. We're, we're totally non-colonization. And this is before the American uh, Civil War. So we're just not even industrialized. But we're out going and exploring people, and we stop off from Japan. And we say, we'd like to trade with you. Genuinely innocent, right? We, we get there, and we have these huge warships. And we're not even the top of the line. We are getting stronger. Don't give me, don't, don't be confused here. We're getting stronger, but we are not as big as like a British warship, right? At this time, not in the 1850s. So we get there, and Japan looks at this and realizes they are totally outgunned. And they agree to have some trade, not because they're afraid, but because they realize they've been left behind. And from that moment forward, they decide to join with the rest of the world. It takes a while. In fact, it's called the Meiji Restoration. You might have seen this before, the Meiji Restoration. This happens in the 1860s, right about the time the United States is going into a civil war. And Japan looks around the world and tries to emulate the one area that seems to be progressing the most. Well, in the 1860s, who is the most powerful country in the world? Great Britain. Great Britain, absolutely. Remember, Great Britain has got his empire down to an art. They're trying not to take over every place. Their goal isn't to have land, but they end up taking land. Remember this, um, and I don't think I used the word, but I know it was on your keyword list, but because I talk about this a lot more in, in world history than I do in Western cities, it's called pacification. Pacification. The root word is to pacify, to kind of make calm. So what happens is that England wants to have ports. And what they really want is truly just a port. The example that they had with the United States tells them that it doesn't really pay to have a ton of people over there because what's going to happen? I mean, they're English, right? They've been educated as English constitutionalism. If you send a bunch of English off to one port, what's going to end up happening in about 100 years? They're going to revolt, right? They're going to want to be and do exactly what they want to do. And England's not really interested in that. In the mercantilist system, it's not that they're anti-democratic, but they really are imperial, which means these guys give the raw materials, and then the British send back, they sell finished product. If you buy the ingredients, the flour, and then you sell the bread back, if you're doing this, what are you going to make in the exchange? A profit. You're always going to sell the finished product for more than that raw material. So the colonies are providing their raw ingredients. They have no industrialization in the colonies. And it's not necessarily deliberate, but in a sense it is. You don't want the industry here. You want industry here. This is where all the industry takes place. 
And so you buy the finished uh, the raw materials, you sell the finished product, not just back to the colonies, but to anybody, you know, France. You might sell it to Germany, you might sell it to anybody. And this is how you get profit. You know, modern age, mercantilism. Mercantilism means that our wealth is coming from money, not land. The land doesn't necessarily provide you anything unless you can get the resources off of it. And this is a modern empire. So England doesn't want to have really anything more than a port. Nevertheless, as a result of pacification, they end up getting some large areas. What particular colony do you remember where England has a huge they basically own it, even though they don't really own it, they kind of own it. It's called the jewel on the crown of the British Empire. India. India. That's exactly right. And India is an interesting area. It's like a kite. Okay, what's fascinating about India is that their cities have trade. And this is where the spice trade, whoopsie, was really originated. It wasn't so much China as it was India. They had routes over the Himalayas, right? Starting as back as uh, 200 BC. We called this the Silk Road. And so there was actually a trail that kind of goes up like this. And they, they do this from the time of uh, Rome in, in its biggest empire, the time of uh, uh, just about Julius Caesar a little bit before Julius Caesar, all the way up until the Emperor Commodus, around 280, so about 400 years. It, it, it equals about the same time of the Chinese Han Dynasty. Okay, And during this period, um, India doesn't really have a big kingdom, but it does have some prosperity right along this area, of course, because that's where the Silk Road is going. So they've had kind of an identity based on trade for almost a thousand years, maybe two thousand years by the time we get up into the 1500s, 1800s, and 1900s. What happens around the 1500s is that we get European traders that come along the coasts. And so they start originally just having ports. And so the Indians are taking whatever their goods are and they're going this way to the ports. Around 1800, England, now being this massive empire, is developing very systematic ports. And by doing this, they're kind of driving out all the competitors. And they're not doing this by guns, they're mainly doing it by profit. We're successful, we're going to make it more inviting for the locals. Okay, now, a couple of things to know. When I say there's a Silk Road, um, I think I mentioned this when we were talking about uh, uh, Marco Polo. You don't actually walk the whole length, right? Marco Polo was the first guy to actually walk the whole length. What you do is you trade from one section to the next, one section to the next, one section to the next. And you probably have maybe a thousand people involved with this Silk Road. And they may live right here. And his job is to walk from here to there, and he trades, and he trades goods. And it's not organized, there's nobody out there saying this is the Silk Road, it just that's the way it's always been. And after a thousand years, you go from here, you get whatever the new goods are, you trade it for whatever you had, so the Silk Road can go to both directions. And these people all the way around are actually doing this, which is why Marco Polo's adventures were so impressive, because nobody ever went the whole depths. You just went to this edge of your territory, you traded to somebody else. He decided to go the whole path. And it, it took him a long time to get there, and when he got to China, he stayed there 30 years. Because this isn't something that you do in a weekend, right? And even then, when he died, people didn't necessarily believe him. But it is what kind of triggers the spice trade. So we know that there is this Silk Road, but in fact, when we are thinking about spices, most of the spices that we're getting aren't actually coming from China, they're coming from here. So it's midway in the Silk Road. The point that I'm trying to say here is that India was never really strongly consolidated. Unlike China that would have really strong periods and then no strong periods, really strong periods, India was always fragmented. The whole nature of the Silk Road is fragmented. The nature of all the trade is fragmented. So this is where pacification comes in. The way England gets involved is that they create a port and then they say, we don't want our goods in these warehouses to be ripped off. So we talk to our local guy, the local leader, whoever that is. 
And we ask them, all we want is to have a little bit of territory. It's called extraterritoriality. Extraterritoriality. It just means it's like a, an, amb an, an, an embassy in, um, in Washington, D.C., the French embassy. That land is French soil. Even though it's right there in Washington, D.C., it's French soil. That's a sense of extraterritoriality. And that's what England wants. And so he's asking for England, do you mind if we make this soil be our soil? It's just where the warehouses are. We don't care about the city or anything else, just here. That way we can have our troops protecting this, our police officers investigating. And usually the Indians say, well, what are you going to give for us? And they say, well, we'll give you our modern technology. So we'll give you guns, we'll give you whatever. Whatever we have, we'll share that with you so that you can also keep peace within the city. Because if you have a big riot in the city, it doesn't matter. We're going to have to have a war. We don't want that. Now, you guys know something about Western Civ. You know something about history. And it's called cultural diffusion. And what does that mean in this context? If we start giving out goodies around these ports, what's going to happen? People are going to go towards the port. They're going to go towards the port. That's one thing. What else? Where are their guns going to go? Where is the technology going to Is it going to stay in the city? No. Cultural diffusion is inevitable. So you say, I'm giving you guns so that your enemy doesn't have them, will be at a disadvantage. You'll be able to defeat them every single time. Well, good. How long will that last? About 10 years. Because after 10 years, what's your enemy going to have? Your guns. They're just going to come up. It's cultural diffusion. It's inevitable. Somebody's going to trade them, whatever the case is. You're going to have it. And so what that means is that now these guys who are attacking are attacking with heavier weapons than they had before. And so then they go to the British and they say, you've got to help us because our enemies are attacking us. And you said you would help us. That's why we gave you the extraterritoriality. So England said, yes, we'll do that. We will keep the peace. And so we will make a zone, we'll put our soldiers out there, and we'll patrol that area. That way you don't have to worry about it. And in exchange, we'll give you some more weapons, and we'll have your people arming. Well, cultural diffusion is inevitable. And if we arm the locals, and we train them in the British ways, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to be trained. It's, it's, it's going to be inevitable, right? So pacification means to keep the peace. In plain English, what this means is that between 1800 and about 1880, England went from having just a few ports to taking over the entire section. And it's important to realize that even though England's happy to have it, England doesn't want it. And why doesn't England actually want to completely control this area? What a big example are they looking to to say, we don't want to actually own it forever? America. America, that's the United States. And so what they're always doing is that they're having the British crown. And the crown comes in, I believe the date is 1867. Okay, The British crown has governors. But right next to the British crown are all the locals. And the local leaders are trained now, the British crown, he's the one that's keeping the peace. So clearly, he's got an upper hand. But the locals are also trained. They also have weapons, right? And so it's actually a relatively peaceful coexistence. Now, if you don't remember too much about India, this is important because remember, Indian has a very high hierarchical society. So you've got the Brahmins up the top, you've got the leaders, you've got the warriors, you've got a whole bunch of different castes. And most of the population is down here. And these guys are always servants. It doesn't matter who it is. So the only people you're really dealing with if you're in England are these people up at top. And so this is kind of how England controls. That's their colony. Now, let's see if we can put all of these things together. I just talked about two different... I know this isn't world history, but you kind of need to understand this in order to understand decolonization, and in order to understand the Cold War. Can anyone jump the gun, kind of brag a little bit and show coolness? What am I getting at with this? Why am I talking about China 
Why am I talking about Japan? Why am I talking about India and their relationship with England? What was the connection? What's, what's the relationship between, say, China and England? What was happening to England? Excuse me, what was happening to China around 1900? It's big, no question, but also fragmented, right? Losing power. But we know something about China. Does it ever stay this way? It goes back and forth. So what's it really eager to go? If you're this now, what, what's, what's in the future? Unification. Unification. Okay, it's pushing to some type, there's a demand for strong centralization. Okay? Very important. What about Japan? What's their relationship? Go ahead. Um, how long did the UK have control on? Uh, I know it's like 97, but how long was it? A hundred years, that's why I came up. So 1897 to 1997. So, what about Japan? Remember, they were isolated until 1600. Uh, I mean, they started being isolated until 1600. Until 1860s, and I'm going to put 1860, um, I think it's 67, but I could be wrong. Maybe it's 1868. It's the Maijay Restoration, right? Maybe in 1864, it doesn't matter. Then what do they do? They come out of isolation. Yes, and what's their goal? To become a world power. To become a world power. That is their goal. And so they are emulating England. They're following England's approach. Right? So that means that they are wanting to be an empire. This is why it's very important to recognize that Japan is in both World War I and World War II. What are they trying to do? That's right. Now, we know why in World War I, why they're on the side of the Allies. Why are they on the side of the Allies in World War I? Who are they trying to emulate? Britain. The British, right? But why aren't they on the British side in World War II? Because they've outgrown. They've outgrown it, but also, what is England doing? Are they empire? No. They're moving in this rule of law, and that's not something that Japan understands yet. They're still thinking rule by might. And which side in World War II is on the rule by might side? Thanks is powers. And then we look here at India. And India is a different. This is kind of explaining kind of the process, pacification. But what we have here with pacification is you almost have dual governments, right? But clearly, who is the teacher and who is the student? Is it equal? There are two governments, but are they equal? No. And that's remarkably important. Because that means you have the British crown, and who's actually keeping peace? Had India really had a centralized government before this? Nothing to this extent. Right? So their locals have a government. But it's really kind of dependent upon the centralization. Right? They never centralize themselves. Well, if we look at this with India, what about Africa? We, we talked about this indirectly when I talked about in the 1880s, there was a scramble for Africa. And I made this reference of talking about cultural diffusion. Who, oh, what was the reason why the Europeans went into Africa? I'll do one more picture here. If you look at Africa, kind of here, Okay. Up until the 1800s, where had been, uh, 1600s, 1700s, where was civilization in Africa? Just along the edges, right? Just along the edges. Why not in the middle? And let's, let's be even more honest. Before 1500, where is civilization in Africa? You, well, yes, you got in the Nile River, but the problem is the Nile River is kind of a little bit unique. Why is that? Because it flows the other way. Yeah, it does flow the other way, but what, what, what's preventing, you know, why doesn't Egypt take over all of Africa? 
you got mountains here, right? What else do you have that kind of creates a fairly significant barrier to civilization expanding in Africa? Giant, huge, enormous desert. This is a huge desert. So what we talk about is sub-Sahara Africa. Sub-Sahara. This is the Sahara, right? So below this, Sahara, that becomes a barrier. So even though the Mediterranean on this side has all the cultural diffusion of Greece and Rome, the Greco-Roman world, right, and Europe and all that, Africa is, is not. So in the 13 to 1400s, particularly in the 1400s, you're beginning to have some civilization in Africa. Where is it going to be? And I don't mean this northern part. <coughs> Where is your civilization in Africa going to be? No. Right here and here. What's there? Why there? <coughs> it has to do with trade routes, right? Who is going through and finding the trade routes to the Sahara? We call them the Berbers, right? But in fact, who are the Berbers? Muslims. Oopsie. The Muslim traders. Remember, the Muslims had this whole area up here. They had it all the way to Spain, right? They had it around here up to Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. So that, that's where their influence was. In fact, wasn't this big, giant block the very reason why we pursued the spice trade? Because who had a monopoly on the trade? Yeah. And so you could not get to India this way. Now, of course, the spice trade, remember, the spice road wasn't a direct road, but the Muslims, by this time, were clearly going from here to India. They were directly going from here, and this is where India is, right here. Okay? They were going straight. And they had, they had kind of a stranglehold on the trade, which is why the Europeans wanted to go around. It's why Columbus went west. Because this is blocked. So what we see here is that the Muslims were going even into the Sahara. And so these were the beginning of some civilization. But what civilization is it most reflecting? One's up here in the Mediterranean. A Mediterranean. Once we start getting Portuguese and Europeans trading, where do the other civilizations start popping up? Where we have... The slave triangle, right? And it's not just slaves, but right along the coast, right? Wherever you would stop for supplies, basically what you develop by the 1700s is this trade network where you stop here. In some cases, you go here, and then you, you go across over to the New World. And so you have a triangle that's Europe, Africa, New World. Europe, Africa, New Europe. But you also have a trade that goes from Europe, touching here, to India, and then, in some cases, you go off to Asia. And so this becomes kind of a triangle here. This becomes a triangle this direction. That becomes your trade up in the 1900. Now, up until the late 1800s, this area here is not explored. Why not? Super easy. There's no reason. There's no reason to, right? Because it's part of a trade route. That's the only reason why this part is developed at all. It's kind of like in even in India. It was really the northern part that had a, a trade route. It wasn't until the British started developing ports along here that you started having civilization along the coast. And then with the pacification, you can see England taking over all of this. In the 1880s, you had the scramble for Africa. What drew the Europeans inland? Does anybody know? And to me, I think it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating story because it goes against what we think of, especially if you think in terms of this dialectic. It just flies in the face of that. King Solomon's mind or something like that? No, but that story is absolutely written during this time period because everybody is fascinated with Africa. There could be riches. King Solomon could have this wonderful city of gold there. Could there be anything there? But that's kind of on the outside. So there are the explorers. There are people that just want to explore. Just like in the 1500s, there are people that want to explore. 
But there's another reason. Does anybody know? Resources? What's the funniest thing is, is you know, what is this place look like? What's in here? That there's natural resources like you've got savannas, you've got uh, the big safaris, the beautiful animals and stuff all around here. You also have them over right here. What about this area? What's in here? Jungles. Yeah, huge, thick jungles. You can't get a lot out of there. In fact, you can't really get a lot out of here unless you've developed it a little bit. And, and I'm going to explain this just a little bit. Remember, when we're talking even 1500s, you don't have companies going out to try to explore Central and South America. Who goes out first? Who are the very first people to go out there? Two groups of people. One of them is super easy. Columbus types, uh, Cabal types, John um, uh, Cabot types. Who, who are these people? Magellan types? Who am I talking about? Explorers. Okay, the very first people are explorers. Well, we kind of know out here, so you're going to have explorers coming in here, but then Who's the second people that went out to the New World? The people who wanted to spread religion. That's exactly it, missionaries. Okay, so who is coming in to Africa? Missionaries. And why are they deciding to going into Africa? Aside from the fact that they wanted to spread the faith, that is one reason. But there's another reason that's even bigger. And it's just it's not going to come to the Garden of Eden is? No, no, no. That's going to be up here in the, uh, Mesopotamia, between the two rivers. Tigris and Euphrates. Ah, uh, you're not going to get this. You have to read my mind, or you have to really be good. We can catch all that. Uh, slavery. Remember what happens around 1800s oh, to slavery? Did did, did, the, did the Europeans invent slavery? You guys remember this, right? Where did slavery come from? When did slavery start? It wasn't at that point. Slavery began. Yeah, <laughs> before history, right? Before history. One band takes over another, they either kill them all or they enslave them. It's, it's not something the Europeans started. In fact, Europe was odd because it was Christian. It did not have any more slavery in its neighborhood. Now, during the 1600s and the 1700s, because there was slavery in Africa, the Africans were selling slaves. The Africans were selling slaves. In fact, many of these countries, Ghana, for example, were basically started as like slave trading depots. They were able to consolidate into a country because they would go out into their area and they would just take over all the neighbors. That would enslave them, and then these guys would be shipped over to the New World. And the reason why the Portuguese ended up doing this, even though there's no slavery in Portugal, and you don't have slavery in England, you don't have slavery in Europe, is because in the New World we needed labor. And so it was just transporting the labor from Africa over to the New World. Okay, but the thing is, did the Europeans ever like slavery? For a thousand years during the Middle Ages, they had no slavery. Now, the, the Muslims didn't have a problem with slavery, and so they had slave trade, a mild slave trade around here, but not in Europe. Why am I telling you this? If the missionaries are going in there, what do they want to stop? See, by 1850, there was a rule that nobody could have slaves. The British, because they're the kings of the oceans, would actually hunt out and try to find trade vessels. And if they found them, they would take the ship. Which is where you get these terrible stories of slavers. When they saw the British ship coming up, they would take all the slaves and throw them in the ocean. Because they didn't want to be caught. Because they would be either imprisoned or killed or arrested or whatever. Because it was a crime. Which, of course, throwing them in the ocean is way worse crime. The point is, though, that the Europeans were trying to stop slavery. By the time you get in the 1870s, who's, who's one of the only countries that's, or continents that's still practicing slavery fairly regularly? Africa. And so the missionaries go in there to try to end slavery. How is that for ironic? Why do I say it's ironic? Why would it be ironic? In our brain, and I know you had this before you came into this class, where do you think slavery came from? The common knowledge. If you talk to your dumb friends, right? None of you guys are dumb. But if you had your dumb friend, and you went to your dumb friend, and you say, where does slavery begin? What are they going to say? The South. Yeah, the South started. <laughs> European started, right? Of course not. But that, the dumb friend has that, right? The irony is that it kind of goes against what we think. Now, the reason why this is very important is that once you've got people there, let's say they're English missionaries, or they're German missionaries. 
or they're French missionaries. Who is going to follow? You're going to get trade. So you're going to get people with plantations. They may not enslave the folks, but clearly cheap labor. Huge plantations. They can hire people for a dime a day, right? And if you've got traders and missionaries and plantation, what is going to follow? Here, I'll give you a big fat hint. If you've got trade... What is going to follow? Definitely cultural diffusion. What else? Not, not. You don't want to remember for the uh, for the um, mercantilism. You don't want industry out here. Industry stays here, but you want that to be safe and secure. So if you've got missionaries in there, and you've got plantation owners in there, and you've got traders in there, what's going to follow? Military. Okay? They don't go in there first. And that's the whole scramble for Africa, when they talk about the scramble. And the scramble for Africa is going on in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. And so what ends up happening to Africa? How many countries are in Africa today? Hussein, can you remember? Uh, a lot. More than, uh, 50, more right? Than, yeah. More than 50, I think so, yeah. So where did those come from? Very, very, very important you get this point. Did they come up because the natives created countries? No. They came up because the military came in, and just like India, you had, even though England did this pacification, other countries just followed the model. You have the local European government. And then what else do you have? The, I'm sorry, not the local. You have the European government, and then you have the local government, made with locals. So who is always on top? The Europeans. But are they training the locals? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, they are. The whole idea of a state is coming from who? The whole idea of treasury, budgets, military, organized standing armies. Where is that all coming from? Europe. Clearly it's coming from Europe, right? But they don't want to just own the country. A colony is going to have the colonial governor, and who's going to be the local police officer? Who's going to take care of local matters? Who's going to have local customs? Who's going to be in charge of that? Locals, right? Okay. Huge point. Decolonization. Can someone try to jump got 25 minutes, so we're not in a hurry here. Although, if I can get it done in 10 minutes, I'll run and get this to me, balance. But let me, let me just get you to figure out, why is this a big, big, big deal for decolonization? Let me just remind you, okay? Remember, we had two main uh, documents, two really important documents in World War II. And they're not like important in the sense that they started World War II, but they are important because they talk about what's going to happen with the Cold War. The first document is the Atlantic Charter. Who wrote this? Who was a part of this? The United States wrote it. The United States. It's an American document, clearly. But who also agrees? France and Britain. Yeah, England is the one that they're talking with directly, and France agree with them, right? And what does this uh, Atlantic Charter really spell out? Aside from the fact that we don't like Hitler, which is really clear, what else does it spell out? They have to end their decolonization. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Decolonization. This is basically the future of the world. Decolonization. But they're going to have the United Nations, which is a little bit like the League of Nations, except it's got some teeth. We're going to have uh, this, the four freedoms. People are going to uh, have uh, basically human rights is what we're going to expect. We didn't call them human rights, we just called them four freedoms. Basically, this is the, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed by the creator with certain animal rights among these lives of pursuit and happiness. And yet, they didn't use a single word of those. They talked freedom of speech, expression, 
freedom of religion, freedom from fear, freedom from want. These are the basic rights that everybody has. That's what they're talking about. Those are the human rights. And that this is a new world order. This is the future of the world. Okay? Great. Really important. What's the other document? In fact, there's a whole bunch like them, but this one is particularly relevant for the Cold War. You're right. Well, I have the Berlin That's it. That's exactly it, but how does that fit, Dr. Zareya? Berlin, Moscow, Berlin, Soviet. Why? What? That's just between Germany and Russia. How does that? It's not the same as Atlanta Charter. Well, remember, the Atlanta Charter is only between the U.S. and U.K., but it represents more than that. What does this represent? What were the What were the purposes? What did the um, What were the clauses? The provisions? Uh, Russia would. Germany's family with, uh, yeah, now that's Germany's. secret, though. That's the secret. The public part was that Germany is not at war with the Soviets. That's basically what it says. But we know, and found out almost immediately in the middle of the war when Germany attacked the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union kind of lets it slip, that the secret provisions is that Poland would be cut in half and shared between Germany and the Soviet Union, and that Soviet Union could attack Finland, and basically what they could create are spheres of power. So what future, what do we see in this worldview? This, this is an empire worldview. And why is this a great big giant deal for the Cold War? Because the Soviet Union begins on this side, and then in 1940, where are they at? They're over here, but this isn't the worldview that they're a part of. They didn't sign up on the Atlanta Charter. They don't see this. And so that means that when we get to the Cold War and we start to decolonize, what that means is that we have each of these colonies around the world, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in South America, you basically have the same pattern. You have the European government, and then you have the locals. And which of these actually has all the knowledge and the technology to create a state? Who brought it with them? Europeans. This is where the evidence, the practice, the history, the experience of statecraft comes from. But the locals are learning, right? Cultural diffusion is inevitable. Well, the war ends. We have the Cold War, and our policy is containment. That's what the Allies decide to do. Containment. What does that mean? Remember, you have three options. And this is when we were talking about the Berlin Airlift. The Berlin Airlift was in 1947. Does anybody remember the details of that? Here's Germany, here's where the Soviet tanks were, and this is Berlin. And they divided up into three parts. In Berlin, uh, the Soviet Union basically put a, a barbed wire around West Berlin and said, nobody comes in. You can go, but no one comes in, so they're going to starve. And so that means that the, uh, the Allies had three options. What were the three options? We get attacked, right? But how does that fit in with our new world order bit? We don't want that. We could do nothing, but what happens when you do nothing? War it's inevitable because you're training them, you're telling them you can do whatever you want to and we're going to sit idly by. <laughs> I'm going to do everything I want to, right? In terms of the power, if you think you rule by might, you're actually encouraging them to expand. So you do nothing, you're going to end up fighting, but you're going to fight when you're in a bad position. So what's the third option? Containment. Well, it's not attacking, it's not doing nothing, you do not allow them to expand. No expansion. That's what this means, right? No expansion. So we go here and we talk about what's happening. Why is this a big deal? Decolonization means what? It means Europe leaves. It means the people that were creating the state in that colony are gone. So who is left? The local. And in terms of Democracy, we love that, right? 
But what's the problem? That gives Russia, not just Russia, but it gives Ukraine the countries who support communism a chance okay. to spread communism. Two issues. Number one, even if there's no problem at all, even if Soviet Union doesn't exist, if England leaves out of India, India was not united by itself. It was united through pacification. There was like a big country that united all the hundreds and hundreds of little groups together. You remove the big guy, what happens to all those hundreds and hundreds of little groups? They start fighting. And this has nothing to do with whether somebody wants to come in yet. This is just its own self. It's a problem. Because you're not really that big. They were smaller. But by having this big country, they want to stay together. What happens? England in 1949 leaves India. Okay? What immediately happens as soon as they leave, in fact, I could be wrong. This might be not be 1949. I'm, I'm sorry. It could be 46. That's right after the war. What, did, what happened to India immediately afterwards? Instant civil war. Because the English were the ones that were keeping the peace. And why are they civil war? Because they want to all be in charge. This is why Gandhi got to be so famous. He kept saying, people, just, just settle down. We'll do this peacefully. He was saying that to the British first, but then he was saying that to his own folks. And in the end, you know what happened? Why do we have Pakistan here? You, do you know why this is Pakistan? Why this is India? In fact, there's two other groups here. Why? Why? What? religion is Pakistan? Muslim, right? What religion is India? Hindu. And so they they just divided. And that was the solution, but it took about four years of civil war for that to happen. And this is without anybody else making a problem. So just the whole point of decolonization itself is a problem. When you're dealing with the only country, excuse me, the only uh, source of your state is that European and the Europeans leave, then just that alone is hard. But what happens when we add to it the fact that we have the natural decolonization? Just by itself, this is the problem. But in addition to this, you also have Cold War containment. And the con Cold War containment means that you have two sides. One side is the rule of law. And this is going to be the allies. This will be England and France and U.S. and dozens of others. And then what's the other side? Rule by might. And this is going to be the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union gets a huge ally right off the bat. Remember I told you about China? China goes between tight and fragmented and tight and fragmented. And they have been fragmented for a very long time. So what are they looking for? Somebody to help them out. Yes, and so they get it. And if you remember, Japan invades Manchuria in 1931. So for 14 years, they are fighting World War II. So whatever government there was in China is just exhausted. So all they need to do is Moscow trains a guy named Mao Zedong, and he starts a revolution, and by 1949, China becomes communist. And if you're a communist, in 1949, do you get to decide what you want to do as a Chinese government? You do what the Soviet Union wants you to do. And so that means that when we look at decolonization, it's not just that we have China, I assume the Soviet Union, but we also have China. And then we have expansion. Expansion into Europe, that's what the Berlin Air Lift was. They were going into Greece, trying to have the same thing happening in Greece. They were going into Afghanistan in the 40s. They were going into Korea. They were going into Vietnam. They are going basically every direction. The Korean and Vietnam Wars were examples of containment. 1949. This is uh, Korea. The Chinese, but mostly the Soviets, were coming down, and as soon as the Allies left, they were going to take over the whole peninsula. 
same time period, down here in China, in Southeast Asia, China was going into Vietnam. The difference here is that for Korea, the entire world, through the United Nations, stood up for containment. And that's what the Korean War was. This wasn't a, the United States War. This was the United States and England and France and a bunch of others, actually, fighting against the Soviet expansion using Chinese folks and local Korean folks. And in the end, by 1953, we came up with an agreement. We said, this is where we'll draw the line. You'll have North Korea, we'll have South Korea, and here, this will be a democracy. They decide for themselves what they want. But we're going to keep a base, an American base there. And why is there a base there? To prevent North Korea from what? Invading. Invading. Now, the thing is, is that in Vietnam, it was France only. And they were going against the opposite side, which was China and the Soviets and the North Vietnamese, who were their locals, right? And as soon as they came up to an agreement, which was right after Vietnam in 1954, what did France do? They got the heck out of there, which meant that South Vietnam was left by itself. And so, yes, they're a democracy with no experience whatsoever. They have all the problems of decolonization, and they've got this threat. They were begging people to help them. The United States says, well, we're in Korea, but we're not here. We don't have any tradition here. We don't have any design to be in here. We're not going to be in there. And so we said, no, 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 until about 1961, when JFK sent some advisors in. By 1963, we had lots of advisors in there. And then when um, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson was president, 1965, we sent in 600,000 troops. That's, that's a police action. Our goal wasn't to take over North Vietnam or even to take over South Vietnam. It was to protect South Vietnam. South Vietnamese wanted us. They begged us to come there. Now what happened by 1971? Five years later. Six years later. We were in the Vietnam War in 65. In fact, it started in 49. Both of these countries, Soviets were expanding in both sides. The difference here is that in North Korea, our policy of containment never stopped. But in Vietnam, the France were gone, so the South was by itself for 10 years. What happens about 1971 is that the American public doesn't want to be in there anymore. And so we leave. We leave, we start pulling out in 71. By 73, we have hardly anyone there anymore. And it's not because we're being pushed out. We just don't want to be there. We don't want to be there supporting South Vietnamese. And so as soon as we're gone, we're gone. We have like maybe a hundred people there, a couple hundred people tops, and they're just advisors. That's when South, uh, North Vietnam, with Chinese officers and Soviet weapons, makes a large-scale invasion in 1975. And what happens? They take over South Vietnam, and then that's it. And what's worse is that one million people are killed in the process. Very bloody. So when the United States looks at this, we say, well, this was a failure. Well, it is in a way, but it's not in a way. We weren't pushed out. We never lost a single battle in Vietnam. But what we were hoping to do is to preserve South Vietnam. Did we do that? No, we left before it was done. But we wanted to make sure that the price of expansion was higher than any benefit. Do you think China wants to expand elsewhere? They were real concerned about Japan. What would happen if Japan, China wanted to take over Japan? That would be a costly war. But what's the likelihood? We met them in Korea, we met them in Vietnam. Are they going to take over Japan? Are they going to try to take over Taiwan? which what used to be a part of China? No. So in that sense, did it, was it successful? The containment was successful globally, but not specifically. I'm not going to get too much into this, but the United States, after World War II, truly is the strongest power 
in the world. It still is. Not just in terms of military, which is pretty clear, but also in terms of the economy. Even today, the United States has more economic power than all the BRIC countries. You guys know what BRIC means. BRICS. B-R-I-C-S. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. BRICS countries. Those are basically all the other non-Western powers. Okay? So you've got the BRICS, you've got the EU, the European Union, which is basically Europe. The United States economy is bigger than each of these. Like, by twofold. It's huge. So that's just the power of the money. It's also the military, because if you've got a strong money, you've also got the ability to get the biggest technology in the world. So clearly, the United States is the leader in the Cold War. They are the leader of the free world. That's why they talk about the free world. But it's the free world, which means how do we lead? Do we send in troops and say, you do what we're going to do or we're going to shoot you? We talked about this last week. How do we lead? Foreign aid. We give money, and then also, you could almost call it pacification of a word, of a type. We try to keep and maintain peace. Does it always work? No. But what we try to do, the rule has always been, the price has to offset the benefit of attack. That's kind of the way. If you're dealing with someone who's ruled by might, they don't understand rule of law. They don't have any experience with it. But they do understand that if they go out there and their hand gets chopped off, they're not going to go out there. So this is the approach you have with the rule by might countries. So then the question is, how does the Cold War ever end? Because basically you have the Soviets... And we call it the Soviet bloc. So basically all the powers that are ruled by might. They want to follow a world view that is ruled by might. And then on the other side is the U.S. and allies, which are all the free world, ruled by law. Right? Well, this is what happens. And we can give the blame... Blame if you're on the other side, to Reagan and Pope John Paul II. How does Pope John Paul II have anything to do with the end of the Cold War? He didn't have a military. The Catholics never have a military. Never have had a military. But what does he have? He's probably the most influential person in the world. It's called moral <coughs> authority. Right? Moral authority. This is the what's right versus wrong thing. Does he have any hand in terms of rule by might? No. No, he is like the voice of law. And we, and we think in terms of natural law. Okay? What about Reagan? Well, the United States. He's the president of the United States. So basically what we had, and we can do this in about two minutes because it's actually not that difficult. Whoopsie. Oh, this is it. I'll just tell you. So the Cold War... Initially, in 1947, with the Berlin Air Wall, that's the origins. And that's what leads us to containment. But there's a problem with containment. Is after a while, you can kind of agree to just always be this way. So you have balance. And so you have, say, the Americans here, and the Soviets here. And these Americans have a free economy, which means that they have money to spend. At any given time, they never spend more than about 8% of their GMP on military. But the Soviets have what's called a command economy. In plain language, that means that there's no freedom. So the government actually decides what's going to be made when. They are in control of all the stuff. The problem with that is that they have to plan it. It's a planned economy. The problem with a planned economy is what? What happens five years from now? What happens even two years from now? Something unexpected. So the point of it is that they don't have very much money. So at any given time, they were spending about 50% of their GMP in order to build up their military. 
And in order for you to have any kind of defense, you have to have some equality. And nuclear weapons was that source of equality. By 1950, both sides have nuclear weapons. The thing is that the United States ruled by law. Right? So we're not aggressive. We are not aggressive. But in order to make sure that the rule by might, people stay in check, there has to be some fear. So you have to promise the Soviets that if they attack, what's going to happen? Mutually assured destruction. Yes, mutually assured destruction, otherwise known as deterrence. Right? If you tell your kid that I'm going to swap your bottom if you take that toy, and he takes the toy, you swat his bottom, what's he not going to do the next time? You're not going to take the toy. The thing is, your kid has to know that you're going to do it. Deterrence is actually based on some type of faith in the results. That's what this whole mutually assured destruction is. If we attack, they're going to be attacked 18 times more. So there's no benefit in it. The price of attacking is higher than any possible benefit you could gain from it. The problem with this, though, is that if you just go for parity, just equality, what will ever end it? Nothing. And so this is where Reagan comes up with a great idea. And he's not the only one that does this. There's a whole bunch of people. And he comes in and they say, what we're going to do is we are going to spin, spin, spin on the military. We're going to make this so unbalanced that there's no way for the Soviets for the Soviets to, to, uh, to match, the Soviets would have to be spending 100% of their economy. And for us, it's still going to be only 16% of our GMP. It's not going to hurt us at all. And if we spin, spin, spin. So that means that the Soviets have two options. They continue to uh, 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 stay in the Cold War, so they basically fight and then become bankrupt. Or, what's the other option? We kept having treaties and diplomacy. And so what we said to him, what Reagan said, is if you stay in this game, you're going to go bankrupt. But at any time, if you want to, we'll just end it. We'll just stop it. Take out your weapons. Take out your military. Just stop being aggressive. And then the whole thing will be over. And so, from between 1980 to 19. 85, the Soviets decided to do this part. And then when they realized that they were absolutely going broke, they immediately started doing these treaties. The START Treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, is one where they're actually trying to take out weapons. And this was an attempt to just end the Cold War. And it was effective, but it was too late. By 1989, the Soviet Union basically fell into uh, um, uh, bankruptcy. The Berlin Wall fell. And the reason why the Berlin Wall fell is that the Soviets just simply left Berlin. They left Germany. They weren't going to spend any money on it. It was like they didn't tell anybody. They were just gone. People went up the next morning. They don't see any soldiers there. They started climbing all over. I remember I was in college when this happened. They were shocked. They couldn't believe it. It was all over the news. The Soviets didn't say a word. And then by the end of the day, they're climbing on top of the wall, they're taking sledgehammers, they're tearing it down. Soviets aren't doing anything. Why? Because they're gone. That was it, the fall of Berlin Wall. This was an attempt to save themselves. The fact is, it didn't. And by 1991, the entire Soviet Union collapsed. And then if the Soviet Union is gone, what happens to the Cold War? It's over. It's over. Let me give you a thought, a final thought.